Jerome Gauntlet, and he'll be telling us about uh, equivariant localization in supergravity. Can you hear me? Is that working? Is that loud? Okay. Okay, uh, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on this wonderful meeting. It's not working. Maybe I'll try a bit higher. Is that any better? No. Like this. Is that better? Uh, okay. Is that okay? That's not okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks to the organizers. Um, but apologies for the, for, from the technical staff. <laughs> Okay, so let's, let me try again. Is this working? Okay, right. Um, so yeah, thanks to the organizers for putting on this meeting. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a particular connection with ICTV indirectly. Abdus Salam, who founded this wonderful, awesome uh, institute, of course, um, he was also the founder of the theoretical physics group at Imperial College. And Imperial College was his intellectual home while he was doing all these other wonderful things. So he recently had a, a big celebration at Imperial about uh, uh, two or three months ago, and we renamed the library in his honor. And we had a big, uh, wonderful outreach day in, in his honor. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some work that I have done with James Sparks, my long-term collaborator, um, and Pietro uh, Benetti Ginellini, who's a postdoc in uh, Geneva. We wrote four papers together over the last year, and then there's another paper with uh, James's student, Alice Lucia, and my student, uh, Yusheng Zhao. So I want to talk about equivariant uh, localization. Of course, this is a topic that's uh, known to, to many of you very well. In physics, it's had a very big impact, starting with the work of Witten, and this highlights Nikita's work on, Nekrasov's work on uh, instanton counting and Cyborg-Witten theory, Peston's work on uh, localizing path integrals on supersymmetric field theories and curve manifolds, and many, many other things besides. In general, in the physics side, equivariant localization is, is generally taken as a, a, a very powerful tool to simplify path integrals down to some finite dimensional integrals, which one can hopefully then, then address. What I want to talk about in this talk is something quite different. It's actually quite simple. Uh, could have been discovered 20 ye years ago, for reasons I'll explain to you later. And it's uh, a, t a tool to compute supersymmetric observables uh, for super in, in the context of supergravity, for supergravity solutions, without ever solving the supergravity equations in motion. That's the basic idea. And there's various applications. And the applications I'll be interested in are in the context of holography. And if I have time, I'll give examples of each of these three. So the first is sort of the most obvious one. ADS-CFT, you're looking for uh, supersymmetric ADS cross M solutions. M is some compact manifold of some dimension. And if you can find such solutions in D equals 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity, you'll have a, found a dual CFT uh, of one less dimension than, the AD, uh, than capital D. And once you have it, you'd like to com compute some observables. If the field theory is of even dimension, for example, the central charge or the dimension of certain protected operators and so on. And it's these kinds of observables that um, one can extract using this equivariant localization. Another application um, is the program of trying to uh, do microscopic state counting interpretation of black holes in asymptotically ADS. In string theory, one of the big highlights is state counting of asymptotically flat black holes, going back to the work of Baffer and Strominger. Um, in about 2015, uh, Benini, Hristov, and Zaffaroni started the program of looking uh, or trying to do the same thing in the context of ADS-CFT. So you construct a black hole in an asymptotically ADS space, calculate its entropy, and then try and recover the ent entropy uh, in the dual conformal field theory that lives at the boundary. So these new tools allow you to get this black hole entropy for black hole solutions without solving the supergravity equations. And then the last topic is um, 
but when you take a supersymmetric conformal field theory, you put it on some manifold uh, with various other operators turned on, so you still preserve supersymmetry. And then you might be interested in calculating the on-shell action, the supergravity on-shell action. And that, by ADS-CFT, is dual to the partition function of the, of the field theory. And I was just telling you before that localization, in the sense of the path integral, is used to calculate that on-shell action. And what I'm talking about is complementary there, therefore, in the supergravity side, how you might get this on-shell action and then compare with what you can get from localization in the field theory. So just so we're all on the same page, what do I mean by supergravity equations of motion? So I mean, uh, schematically, I'm only interested in the bosonic fields of the supergravity. So there's some generalized Einstein equations. The Ricci tensor will equal some various uh, stress tensor components, depending on what dimension and what theory you have. There'll also be some additional equations of motion. I'll just generically refer to those as flux equations of motion. So that's uh, the equations of motion. And then ones that are supersymmetric also admit killing spinners. And structurally, the killing spinner has uh, th this, this form. There's some uh, covariant derivative acting on the spinner epsilon. And then there's some Clifford connection where you're contracting in the fluxes with the gamma matrices that generated as a Clifford algebra in some way. And typically, there's also some other additional algebraic type uh, equations you need to solve. So I'm just being schematic here. I'll give you one detailed example later on if you haven't seen this before. And what I'm interested in is any supersymmetric solutions of, of any theory that has an asymmetry killing vector. So um, we construct as a killing spinner by the, from epsilon, the killing spinner, we construct this bilinear. So that's a vector field on the manifold. And I want that to be a killing, uh, killing vector. I demand that's a killing vector. And I also want the lead derivative of the spinner with respect to the killing veil to be charged. So Q is some non-zero uh, parameter uh, which carries the charge of the killing spinner. So this is extremely general. Um, it's not completely general. For example, if you take a calabi yau manifold, they have covariantly constant spinners, but they have no killing vectors. But um, that, that aside, this is a very, very general setting, and I'll give you several examples uh, uh, where, where, where this structure exists. So as soon as you make that observation, there's a very simple thing you can think about, is you can construct the equivariant um, exterior derivative, which is just a combination of the ex ordinary exterior derivative plus the contraction with the killing vector. And if you square that operator, it squares to the lead derivative. So if you're acting on the space of invariant uh, forms it, on the manifold, then you have a... Um, uh, an operator which squares to zero, so there's a co corresponding cohomology. So a very obvious question in supergravity, therefore, is what is this co cohomology telling us? And I, it's surprising that this hasn't been asked, as I said, many, many years ago. There's more general spinning, spinner bilinears you can construct, um, and schematically here they are. So here is some rank R form, so gamma R is just some anti-symmetrized um, product of ga the gamma matrices generating the Clifford algebra, and these are just some local coordinates on the manifold. And there's, if again, depending on the dimension you're looking at, there could, the, there could also be the charge conjugate spinner that you can construct some differential forms from as well. Mm -hmm. So you can construct all of those differential forms as spinner, spinner bilinears. And then a program that I and collaborators initiated about 20 years ago was um, to recast the information in the killing spinner in terms of a G structure, which is essentially algebraic and differ differential relations uh, captured by these killing spinner bilinears. So there's a lot more to say there, but this is uh, work from a long time ago, and I don't want to go through that. But that was a big program that, that led to a lot of successes of understanding generic classes of supersymmetric solutions of supergravity theories. The new observation is this. This is the main point. It's very simple. But uh, um, and is that you can construct a multiform. So it's a, a linear combination of, of differential forms of different rank, which are polynomials in the supergravity fields and the bilinears, which I just mentioned, and they're equivariantly closed. So there are these natural canonical equivariantly closed forms. 
And just again, if you haven't seen this, this has to, for this to be zero, this has to be a polyform because remember D increases the rank. So the D of this form should equal the contraction of this form with the killing vector. And there's a sequence of relations to make that equivariantly closed. So that's a new observation. In general, there are these equivariantly closed forms in supergravity theories. What are they good for? So a number of comments. The first is, and this, is, this will be important later, is to construct these forms, you only need a subset of information in the killing spinner equations. You don't need all the information in the killing spinner equations and the equations of motion, just a subset. So correspondingly, when I said that these equivariantly closed forms, it's an off-shell statement. And that off-shellness will come back a little bit later. A second point is that there's several of these equivariantly closed forms in a given theory. We don't have, at the moment, any canonical general understanding of, of where they're coming from. It's just take a supergravity theory, start playing around this. You can just start constructing them. So that's an open question, what, what, the, biggest, what the bigger, deeper reason for all this is. But nevertheless, they, in any given context, several of them exist. And most importantly, and probably quite closely related, is you can use these to, cons to actually uh, obtain physical observables of the theory just using this equivariant cohomology. In other words, the topology of the solution and the R symmetry, the R symmetry being the killing vector, that's enough information to be extract out this physical information. Provided, that is, the solution exists. So if a supergravity solution exists, this technology allows you um, to extract out the physical information. And the key tool to extract out the information is this famous BVAB uh, theorem. So let me just run through this. I know many of you would have seen this, but if you haven't seen it, it's worth running through. So I'm taking the M to be an even dimensional manifold, but I'm going to think about here integrating um, an equivariantly closed form uh, phi over the, over the manifold or an invariant closed submanifold, invariant under the action of the killing vector. And when we have an integral of a polyform, it just means integrate the rank form, which is the same rank as the dimension of, of the space you're integrating over. And what this theorem says is that the integral of this uh, equivariantly closed form is given by a sum of integrals over the fi fixed point set of the action of the killing vector. So the fixed point set of the killing vector is where the killing vector vanishes, so where psi equals zero, and that could have various disconnected components of different dimension. So here I've got the sum over the different uh, fixed point sets, different co-dimension, and then I've got an integral here over f, and uh, f star is the pullback of um, the fixed point set to the manifold. That's the, equivariant, the same equivariantly closed form that appears here, is appearing here. Bi, that's appearing here, are the weights of the action of the killing vector. So if you take the fixed point set, there's some normal bundle, the directions away from the fixed point set, and I'm assuming just for simplicity that there are some of line bundles. So just think of these as a sum of complex lines. And the killing vector in some local coordinates can take that form. So take your normal directions, think of them as a bunch of R2s, and you're just rotating in ordinary polar coordinates around the origin of each of those points. And the weights of each of those terms is just the weights of the action on that normal bundle. So you can see the BIs appear here, and they also appear here. And finally, what's this C1 here? That's just the churn class of, this, of these line bundles. And it's Okay, we're integrating differential forms, so as usual, you just expand that, bring that up to the numerator, and then you integrate the, the corresponding weight form. And then finally, we also allow here, this D here, is that the normal space, I said it was a bunch of complex lines, but you can actually allow that to be orbifolds. So there's, um, gamma is a, a finite group of order DF, and then DF then pops up in this term here. So this formula is basically at the, once you have some equivariantly closed forms, you want to use this formula as much as you can. It starts with a bigger integral and reduces it to smaller and smaller integrals. 
I'm just going to rewrite that here because it's even simpler if I do it this way. So I've just expanded that churn class term in the denominator and collected the terms. So here's the integral of phi on the left-hand side. And the fixed point contribution is just this simple thing here. So that's, there's n weights because there's two n normal directions. And phi naught is just the lowest component of the equivariant closed form. So if you just have fixed points, your integral is just given by evaluating these, uh, that, that term at each of the individual fixed points. If you have fixed two-dimensional surfaces, you now have to do this integral, and you can see you have an, a combination of phi 2 and phi naught with the, the churn classes of the line bundles. Good. So that's the BVAB formula, which is what we use, and I'm not going to go through many details when I eventually come to the examples, but this is the key tool where one does all the integrals that one wants to do. So just uh, finally, just to give then a, a, a trivial example, if we just take the two-sphere, here's the metric on the two-sphere in some standard coordinates, and I take psi to be just the killing vector which rotates the two-sphere. Clearly, that has two fixed points. You can do this in your head. Here is an equivariantly closed form. It satisfies this condition here. So the BVAV formula says that if you want to calculate the volume of the two-sphere, you can integrate phi along the two-sphere that has two fixed points. So you should evaluate phi naught divided by the weights at the north and south pole. And then if we just look at this, if we go to the north pole, we see that B is 1, because just d by d phi is rotating the tangent plane by weight 1. If we go to the south pole, B is minus 1, because there's an orientation that's rotating in the opposite direction. So you simply just substitute into this formula, and hey presto, 4 pi appears. So of course, that's a trivial example because we know how to calculate the volume of that two-sphere. But of course, this, for, for, this um, formalism can be used in highly non-trivial, non-obvious situations. Good. OK, so with those, that, uh, those preliminaries out of the way, I want to now just, uh, as I said, hopefully talk about three examples, if I have time and we'll see how far we get. So there are going to be three separate examples of supergravity solutions where we'll can construct some uh, BPS observables without solving the PDEs. So the first class is the general class of ADS5 cross N6 solutions of D equals 11 supergravity that preserves supersymmetry. So these are the most general ways in which you could have an N equals 1 supersymmetric conformal field theory realized with an 11-dimensional M-theory dual. And the data, or here is the metric, ADS5, here's M6, and lambda is a function on M6. So this has all the isometries of ADS5, this warped product metric, and G4, the other bosonic field of D equals 11 supergravity, is a four form on M6. And actually, we need a flux quantization condition on that, so there's a normalization constant, but G, G4 is an integral cohomological class. <coughs> We want this to be supersymmetric, so we want, uh, we want an, the solution to admit um, solutions to the 11-dimensional killing spinner equation, which I'm not going to write down, but the 11-dimensional spinner I decompose into a 5-dimensional spinner, a killing spinner on ADS5, and epsilon, epsilon is a spinner on M M6. And if you look at that in detail, that 11-dimensional supersymmetry condition, the one we're interested in, translates into this condition in six dimensions. So there's a covariant derivative acting on epsilon. Gamma star is a chirality operator. And here's the four-form flux contracted in with the gammas generating the Clifford algebra. And there's this algebraic condition down here um, with some slightly different factors and so on. OK. So if you're looking for supersymmetric solutions of this form, you'd want to solve the equations of motion, which I haven't written down, for this ansatz, and ask, ask that it also admit solutions to these killing spinner equations. So the, 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 the uh, program is construct bilinears with some good taste and see where it takes you. And you construct a scalar. It turns out that the scalar is uh, con um, the derivative of the scalar is, is constant. So we'll normalize that to 1. You can construct another scalar on M6 using the chirality operator as a bilinear. You can construct a one-form K and a one-form Xi flat. You can construct a two-form Y. 
and the two form y primes with gamma star. So that's the key things we'll need. Not obvious that that's the case, but it is. First of all, xi is, is the one form that's dual to the R symmetry killing vector. Now, the fact that we have an R symmetry killing vector is, is absolutely expected because any n equals one conformal field theory has an R symmetry that must have been realized by a killing symmetry on M6. And we knew it was there, and there it is. Second comment is we can certainly construct more bilinears. We could construct three form bilinears, four form bilinears, which then would get by Hodge duality be related to two, one, two form. But we could also construct bilinears using the conjugate spinner. And the, the point here is that we're not going, we, won't, we won't need them for what I want to do here. In the old work I did 20 years ago, we used everything and we, uh, we, we, did, we came to some nice conclusions, which I don't want to go into that. The main point here is you can get a lot out with a lot less. And as I said before, this means that we're only using a subset of the killing spinner equations and equations of motion. So what I'm talking about is going to be partially off shell. Um, a convenient definition, uh, instead of using sine xi as eta, I'll just dress that with the warp factor and call that y. And I'll let you, I'll just, that, that's a, the same information in, as the bilinear. And it turns out dy is related to the, to the one form k. And here is the equivariant, one equivariantly closed form. It's the volume of the six manifold, star of y, that's a four form. Uh, y is a two form, and it's dressed with the warp factor and this spinner bilinear here, and then y cubed appears there. It's not at all obvious this is, is equivariantly closed, but go back to those killing spinner equations, and you just work hard to do that, and it is. And what's nice is that the top form is not any old form. If you integrate phi along the whole manifold, it gives you the acentral charge of the dual field theory. So in other words, if you want to calculate the acentral charge of any solution of, these, of this form in M theory, you can just evaluate that integral, and you can evaluate it using BVAB. Second, there's another one, which is an equivariant completion of the four form. So there's a four form flux, there's a two form, and there's uh, a scalar. And this is also equivariantly closed. So I told you that we want to impose flux quantization as part of the physical criteria of solutions. That can also be implemented using BVAB. A Y. There's Y. Okay. Good. Okay, so now we've got those equivalently closed forms. I want to now put these tools to work and show you that it's useful. And an alternative uh, title would be computing the acentral charge without trying. I mean, trying is construct a supergravity solution, solve all the PDEs or the ODEs, then do the integral and see what answer you get. And we're going to get it much more simply than this. So I'll illustrate. Um, using a particular class of examples. And this is just illustration. There's uh, other things you can do, but I think these are the simplest ones to explain the formalism. So I'm going to consider taking five brains and then wrapping it on the Riemann surface inside a Calabi L3 fold. So this is an old uh, story that was first uh, uh, introduced into our field by Maldacena and Nunes, who considered taking five brains and wrapping them on a Riemann surface of genus G. This, and more recently, um, we realize that you can also generalize this to wrap uh, five brains on spindles. A spindle is an orbifold. It's topologically a two-sphere, but at each of the north and each of the poles, it has uh, orbifold singularities labeled by two integers. So there's no covering space which gets rid of those orbifold singularities. And in studying both these examples, they have some different features, and that's why I want to discuss both of them. So a local model of the Calabi L would be you take your Riemann surface and consider the sum of two line bundles over the Riemann surface. And to make sure the, van the first term class vanishes, you should have this condition here. P1 plus P2 is the Euler character 
of either the spindle or the Riemann surface. So that's the topological inf part of the topological information we're going to put in to, to, the, to, to extracting the answers for the uh, supergravity solutions. So you take your five brains, you wrap them on this Riemann surface. You have a four dimensions of the five brain which are non-compact. If at low energies this flows to a conformal field theory, there should be an ADS5 cross M6 solution. You're not guaranteed that, but if it does, then, then there should be such a solution. And moreover, the solution should have this topology. A four-sphere bundle that's fibered over the two-dimensional surface. And if you think of the four-sphere as embedded in R5, like this, then the two uh, factors of C1 are twisted using those line bundles I just mentioned before. Okay, so what I'm saying is, think about five brains wrapping Riemann surface in Clabiel. That's telling you a lot about the topology of M6 that w in the ADS5 cross M6 solution. So I'm using that information. So let's do the Riemann surface case and then look at the spindle case. So the Riemann surface case, we're almost done in fact, although I'm not going to show you all the details. The, um, if I think of d by d phi, phi i as rotating these two complex lines I, I mentioned up here, they will give rise to killing vectors that are acting on the four sphere. And that, that much like the two sphere example in that tri little simple example I gave you before, these killing vectors will have fixed points at the north and south pole. So that, this killing vector, this R symmetry killing vector, will have fixed points at the north and south pole, and those fixed point sets are the Riemann surface itself. The four sphere is fibered over the Riemann surface, so if you go to fixed points at the north and south pole, you have a copy of the Riemann surface. A detail is that if you look at the uh, spinners at the fixed point sets, they're necessarily chiral, and that translates into this one extra condition. There's a little bit of work required to get that, but that's, that's a fact. And at this point now, we have our equivariantly closed forms. I've told you about the topology, there's fixed points. We just go to BVAB and do the integrals. And they're not that hard, but I'm not going to do any more details of that. I'm going to just tell you the answer. And the answer is this. So we implement flux quantization. So the integral of G4 on the four sphere, that's the only four cycle that's around, is N. And the central charge takes this very simple form here. So P1 and P2, that's the topological information telling you about the Calabi-Yau your Riemann surface is sitting in. And B1 and B2 are the two weights of the killing vector that we inputted it. I, I didn't, that's a standard thing of ADS-CFT in the sense that that top form back here, um, if you integrate this, just forget everything else, but you just integrate that, that will give you your five-dimensional Newton's constant. And the five-dimensional Newton's constant is known to be proportional to the acentral charge of the field theory. Yeah, thanks. That's a standard ADS-CFT fact. But what, of course, what we're doing just to, uh, yeah, is, is using the lower dimensional forms to do that integral. And in fact, it's fixed, it, there's a fixed Riemann surface, so that Y integral comes into play. I, I, don't, I don't want to go into the details of the computation. The spirit of it is BVAB just says your higher dimensional integral turns into simpler, smaller ones. And moreover, when you go through it, you get right down to this true, well, very, very simple answer. Now, the first thing about this, and I told you this several times already, this is an off shell result. I, this expression is not the final unshell result. It's subject to this constraint, which I said came from chirality conditions. But what you should do is extremize this over B1 and B2 subject to that condition. And if you do that, you'll get an answer which is exactly the same as the known supergravity solution answer. But we never solved any PDEs. All I just assumed is that the solution exists, input of the topology. This result also agrees with the off-shell field theory computation. So you can take the M5 brain, you can ask, about, look at its anomaly polynomial, reduce on the Riemann surface to a four-dimensional theory, and then there's this technology of A-extremization, A-maximization, and A-maximization is a, a pr procedure to maximize the A-central charge 
as a function of trial asymmetry charges. And that's exactly what's happening here on the gravity side. It's exactly mirroring those results in the field theory. And I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough that this, this computation I've just outlined is much simpler than constructing the supergravity solution. Okay, so that's the, the, the Riemann surface case. What about the spindle? It's almost the same, but there's one interesting feature which is different, which is a spindle. I didn't tell you this before, but I, um, I demand that it has a, a killing uh, a symmetry rotating the spindle. That's my definition of a spindle. So the killing vector could be the same one I was talking about before acting on the four sphere, but it could also have a leg rotating the spindle. And if you think about that for a moment now, the fixed point set is at the north and south pole of the four sphere plus the north and the south pole of the spindle. So you do the same thing with BVAB, but now there's just fixed points. So it's a different computation, but you go through the technology and you come up with this answer here. So B1 and B2 are are the weights of the north pole of the four sphere and the north pole of the spindle dressed with some extra factors. B naught is the factor of the, the leg of the killing vector along the spindle direction. And B1 plus B plus two, B1 plus or minus, B2 plus or minus are constrained by these conditions here. The details don't really matter. It's just it's the spirit of the fact that you get the result and you get an answer which now requires you extreme, it's an off-shell answer, extremizing not just over B1 and B2, but also B0. And again, you get the exact result that you get from the explicit supergravity solution. It also agrees with the off-shell field theory computation, which uh, you can get by anomaly polynomial computations. And for people in the audience who know about this, the notion of gravitational block was introduced by Hosseini, Haristov, and Zaffaroni. That was like a field theory way of um, getting expressions for central charges, and you can see this is breaking up into two pieces, one at each, located at each pole, and they called this a gravitational block. Um, so in a sense, what I've just told you is from a gravitational point of view, we've proved the gravitational block formula in this context, but that's an aside. When you're varying the Bs, when you're extremizing with respect to the Bs, you're varying the geometry or the killing form or both? The, 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 the killing vector. So you, You've so got a fixed the, geometry and you're varying the killing vector. Fixed topology. Yeah. And then I have a killing vector. I see. I, you have a vector space of killing vectors and you're varying within that vector space. Exactly. I see. Exactly. Okay, so that's the end of example one. Uh, and Hope was probably on track to do all three examples. Example two has a slightly different flavor. Um, so it's to do with uh, construct, calculate, computing black hole entropy for ADS4 black holes. So we take a four-dimensional gauge supergravity with an ADS4 vacua, and we imagine that inside that ADS4 space, there's a black hole. And if it's supersymmetric, as you go to the near horizon, it will look like ADS2 cross M2, M2 is the horizon of the black hole, and we want to calculate the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of that black hole. So the topology of that horizon could either be a Riemann surface or it could be a spindle. Again, uh, this, is a, a this is sort of an older story. This is a newer story. And you might wonder what sort of black holes we're talking about with spindles. And the spindle, the, the orbifold singularities of the north and south, south pole, are associated with the black hole accelerating. Or there is acceleration in the black hole geometry. In any case, we want to calculate the area of this at M2. And we can again do this by localization. And it's effectively a new version of the attractor mechanism in the context of gauge supergravity black holes. So just a quick summary of uh, the ingredients that go into N equals 2 gauge supergravity. So we have, um, I'm imagining we've got gauge supergravity coupled to N vector multiplets. So we have a met the bosonic fields are a metric in this four-dimensional theory. There's N plus 1 gauge fields labeled by index capital I. 
There's n complex scalar fields labeled by x capital I as a function of the zi's. So there's a constraint amongst these. And those zi's characterize, parameterize a special Kähler manifold, uh, which has a Kähler potential k. There's a holomorphic prepotential, which is a, a function f, which is a holomorphic function of these xi's. And I said it's a gauge supergravity, and the gauging is specified by these fi gauge parameters. If you've seen this, you know this very well. If you haven't seen this, this is just some in ingredients that go into defining the theory. So starting with these ingredients and the killing spinner equations, which I'm not going to write down for this case, you start playing around. Can you construct some bilinears? Can you construct some equivariantly closed forms? And, you can, and the answer is you can. So you can then start evaluating things using BVAB again. And I'll focus on this spindle case. And the reason why, if you're fully on, up, up to speed with me at the moment, is this, for high genus bigger than one, there's no killing vectors on this space. So I need a killing vector to, to, to play my game. So this spindle is the context in which we want to use this technology. The two-sphere case and the torus are special cases. But generically, it's the spindle case you can use this technology. So as I said, I'm not going to tell you anything about what the, the equivariantly closed forms are, how you actually do the computations, but you can do it. They're not that hard. And the final result for the black hole entropy is given by a sum of two terms, one associated with the north pole of the spindle, another one with the south pole of the spindle. And the holomorphic prepotential is appearing here. And it's a function of what I've called dress scalars. So if we look at this for a second, x capital A were the scalars of the gauge supergravity. K is the Kähler potential. Lambda was a warp factor. And P is a spinner bilinear, which I didn't define for you, but that's what it is. So you consider this specific combination uh, together to form little xi. And then you evaluate the prepotential as a function of those x's at the north pole and the south pole. And B naught is the component of the, it, it, sorry, it's the weight of the killing vector along the spindle direction. And there's some constraints on these x plus and minuses. And again, the details don't matter, but you can see the gauging parameters for the x pluses satisfy this condition. On the x minus, there's a slightly different condition. There's a constraint on the magnetic fluxes, which is related to x plus and minus. But the most important thing is all this data What's free here is B naught and X plus or minus. That's what's appearing as free data here. So I'll come back to sigma in a second. B naught, X plus or minus is the data here. Um, these constraints say that if you extremize over B naught, X plus or minus, it's actually a closed system and you can solve it. So you do that extremization and you get the entropy of the black hole. Um, not, not in detail, in, in, in general, uh, there's an eye extremization that people have thought about in the context of these black holes in ADS. So that's the spirit of where, where it come from. But the map between the extremization I'm, I'm talking about and what's happening in field theory, it, there's no direct map between those. But overwhelmingly, it feels like there should be. Um, yeah, the, the sigma, it's, it's, a, it's a technical point, but it turns out that on spindles, there's two ways to preserve supersymmetry, are called a twist or an anti-twist. And a twist means that the spinner chirality at the north pole is the same as at the south pole. Anti-twist, the opposite chirality. In any case, there's two cases to consider. But both those cases can be implemented here. You can extremize over this, and you get the known supergravity uh, result in the known supergravity solutions. And again, we didn't solve any equations of motion uh, of the supergravity. We just used equivariant localization. Um, oh, quick, three quick comments that are a little bit aside, but just let me just quickly run through those, and I'll turn to the last example. <clears throat> I've been just talking about the spindle now, but if you just formally set m plus or minus to 1, and you take b naught goes to 0, that's the weight along the spindle direction, you actually get the result for the black hole entropy of spherically symmetric black holes in gauge supergravity. And you, exact, in fact, recover this old attractor result of Cacciatore and Clem, Dalagata and Necky. Another comment is, 
I was talking about general gauge supergravities, but if you take the STU model, which is a sp specific one, you can uplift the solutions on the seven sphere. And if you do that, you'll get an ADS2 cross Y9 solution, and Y9 is an S5, S7 fiber over spindle. And that Y9 has what's called a GK geometry, and with a completely complementary set of geometric techniques, uh, Martelli, Sparks, and collaborators and I have been exploring that. And that's sort of a complementary set of results where you can get the, the answer I just gave up using a completely different set of techniques based on this nine-dimensional uh, geometry. So, it's, so it's, an adver it's an adverb for this work. It's not directly connected. I was talking about vector multiplets. You can also add hypermultiplets to this story, but I won't say anything more about that now. And the final example... <coughs> is, um, it's again in D equals 4 gauge supergravity, N equals 2. I'll be thinking about Euclidean gauge supergravity now. And this is so simple, I can just write down uh, in the minimal case what the, the full theory is. So it's just Einstein-Maxwell with a negative cosmological constant. There's a boundary action, which is given by extrinsic curvature term, a constant term, and a Ricci scalar of the boundary. The killing spinner equation is also simple enough. You can just write it down. There it is. And the significance of these solutions, in general, is that any solution of this theory, you can uplift on a seven-dimensional Sasaki-Einstein manifold, and you'll get an 11-dimensional solution that's dual to a three-dimensional N equals 2 CF, SCFT on the boundary of this manifold M. So I'm now thinking about the full four-dimensional manifold with a boundary, and that's where this three-dimensional field theory lives. <clears throat> so, if you can construct such a solution, you say, I'm interested in a, a, a particular conformal field theory on a particular three-manifold. You would like to find, solve the equations of motion where you fill in that four-manifold with the three-manifold boundary, calculate its onshell action, and that should give you the logarithm of the partition function of the, the dual field theory. <clears throat> this can be constructed using localization in favorable situations. And here we want to say, what can we say about that using localization in gravity? There's one subtlety, which is you can't use BVAB directly because we now have a boundary, and BVAB does not, is not set up. It's, it's based on closed manifolds. However, that turns out not to be an obstacle. So the on-shell action turns out to be the integral of an equivariantly closed form which I'm not going to write down, but you construct it from bilinear as much as I was indicating before, but you still have this boundary action. But we can't just use BVAB directly on this. But if you look at the proof of BVAB, it's basically Stokes' theorem. So if we assume that the fixed points are only in the interior in the bulk of the four-dimensional geometry, this integral is a boundary integral plus a fixed-point integral. The fixed-point integral is BVAB, and the boundary integral is something you have to deal with. And interestingly, that boundary integral exactly cancels this one. So after all, the BVAB formula of just evaluating the fixed point set does work. What's the result? Well, we're, we're here we have a four-dimensional manifold. Killing vectors, the fixed point sets are either two-dimensional or four-dimensional. So Gibbons and Hawking in 1977 called these nuts and bolts. Nuts are fixed points, and bolts are fixed surfaces. And I think I was mentioning this before, if you, the spinner has fixed chirality on the fixed point set. So the final answer is this very uh, nice formula here. So you do the equivariant localization, use BVAB, and you get a sum over nuts with a particular chirality label by B plus or minus, sorry, by plus or minus. You have this nut contribution, which is just the, the weights of the killing vector, uh, a function of those. And then there's also these integrals over the fixed bolts. And we have the churn class of the tangent bundle, and we have the churn class of the normal bundle, and that's the final answer. So no matter how complicated your solution is, how many bolts and nuts it'll have, then this will be the answer. One thing I want to emphasize, which maybe in the examples I said before, um, 
I illustrated with known supergravity solutions. So I said, here is, no, I said, here is this new formalism. You go through it, and you get an answer. And oh, look, it agrees with the known one. But that's not the point, of course. The point of, of this whole formalism is it's going to give you tools to get the answer when you can never construct the, the solution. or It's extremely difficult. And this is one example. So provided the solution exists, this will be the answer. And there will be many cases where, I mean, you'd have to solve a couple set of PDEs to find these uh, solutions. Um, I'll just quickly flash up as I'm running out of time. Still in the four-dimensional theory, I was just talking about minimal gauge supergravity. You can add in vector multiplets. And the analog of that, whoops, that formula I just wrote down just gets dressed like this. So here's, here's the on-shell action. It's a sum over knots. As the, the weights of the killing action. But now the pre-potential is appearing here as a function of these dress scalars u. And there's an integral over bolts with some derivatives of the pre-potential and so on. And this result basically covers the case of STU. It's the dual supergravity results for ABGM and S3, ABGM and S1 cross Riemann surface, ABGM and M3, where M3 is an S1 bundle over a Riemann surface. And these cases, the gravity solutions are known, partially known, and in this case, basically not known. Whereas this answer, using these much more general techniques, is just giving it to you straight away. OK, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So just to summarize, uh, the, the main take-home message is it's a new te technique for computing BPS observables for supersymmetric solutions in supergravity. It's very, very general. You can just take any supergravity theory you like, and you're going to find something like this. I illustrated with a bunch of um, different examples. You can certainly recover, as I was just saying, known solutions, but the main interest in this is that it's going to give you answers for solutions that probably can't be constructed. What I mean by probably can't be is you'll be solving a system of PDEs in at least two, if not three, variables, and even maybe numerically, it'll be even out of reach. We've looked at a few other cases. And I'll just quickly flash what they are. ADS3 cross M8, corresponding to five brains wrapping four circles, uh, four surfaces, polymorphic four surfaces. ADS3 cross M2, <coughs> um, and six-dimensional Euclidean supergravity. But there's many, many more cases to look at. So it's an invitation to young people to work on this topic. There's lots to do. Um, one thing, every, all these examples, M8, M2, M4, and so on, they're all even dimensions, and that's where BVAB naturally works. But odd dimensions, there's many super interesting supergravity questions in odd dimensions. I think something can be done, but nothing's been done on that yet. At the moment, it works, but we don't quite know why it works. At this stage, the way I would say it works is take any supergravity, think of the kind of solutions you're interested in, think of the observables that you want to calculate, and then go and try and construct a, a equivariantly closed form for it. And in every case, that just works. So it's not, I mean, you have to play around. A bit of work's required to find it. But in every case, that's worked. Um, and the last comment I wanted to make was, um, th this is not completely magic. You have to know the solution exists. But once the solution is known to exist, then this technique will then give you the answer to these physical observables that I was mentioning, different in each case. I do wonder if there's a converse to this, that in some cases there's sufficient conditions which uh, you can at least conjecture where existence would be guaranteed. So for example, for the ADS5 cross M6 solutions, say you input a topology, you say here is the action, of, uh, uh, the, here is the choice of killing vector, some extra information, you, you go through the formalism, you calculate a central charge, if the central charge is negative, there can't possibly be a solution. You can actually do, calculate some more things, which I haven't had time to tell you. For example, the, um, the, the conformal dimensions of some chiral primaries. So it could be, do the BVAB formalism calculation. If the central charge is positive, if the uh, dimensions of these conformal primaries are all satisfying unitary bounds and so on, then there's a converse and the solution must exist. But that's pure conjecture. But that, at least in some of these cases, would be a very nice thing. I'll stop there.
Uh, I was wondering if you have any comment on possible interplay between these and uh, twisted supergravity sort of uh, calculations or ideas. Like, I don't know if when you localize to something which is not a point, but is a, is a higher dimension manifold, could it be a, like a variational version of this extremization over Bs that you had? Something where you extremize over functions or lower dimensional fields? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, the short answer is I don't know, but in, in this context, um, there are cases where the fixed point set is not just points, it's high dimensions, but the final localization that you need to, sorry, the extremization you need to do is just over the choice of the killing vector. Um, yeah, so in that sense, uh, the extremization, I mean, the extremization that happens in this formalism is sort of the one you would expect from the field theory point of view. And that's just a straightforward choice of, choice of the R symmetry. However, th there could be more, that, more that's there. I, I think the biggest thing I'd like to know if there's any direct connection between this and local localization of the path integral. I mean, there's some algebraic structure in both cases. That's just somehow the essence of it. And w w we haven't got that understanding on, on this side. But there's just some algebraic little module that, that's there that's just being cranked along, I think. Some informal sense. Uh, I have a question here. Here, uh, I was wondering in this calculation where you had a cancellation between uh, a term coming from the bulk and the boundary action. I was wondering, in order to check this cancellation, does it work like specifying a particular supersymmetric boundary condition, or you can check it irrespectively of the boundary condition? So, yeah, so you need to have the, the renormalization scheme, which is those particular counter terms, that is supersymmetric. So I didn't, so for the minimal gauge supergravity, it's kind of straightforward, but for the, when you add in vector multiplets, you have to have all the right superpotential terms and so on. So you have to have a supersymmetric scheme. Okay, thanks. So if I understood correctly, you were saying that um, there's some integral you begin life wanting to compute on supergravity side, which has some known meaning on the other side. And uh, you have killing vector on supergravity side, or you want look for one which has some known meaning on the other side, this R symmetry or whatever. So, and then you do some procedure, some new procedure on supergravity side, which is taking equivariant completion, which doesn't change the integral over there. And so what I wanted to know was, is there some analog, what, on, what, is, what sits on the other side from taking this operation of taking equivariant completion? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I, I, don't, know, I don't know the answer to it, um, if it does make sense. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to, to my mind, at the moment, it still seems somewhat miraculous. In fact, historically, the reason, I, I didn't, I, I sort of rushed over that, but this formula here, um, these people constructed this formula just by brute force. So in a sense, I think another way of saying it is this equivariance um, completion in the story and so on is an explanation of where that came from. But if there's more physical interpretation of these lower dimensional terms, I mean, there is a, the bilinear is in the killing spinner. Um, but that's not a direct physical, kind of identified as a direct physical observable. I, yeah, I, <laughs> it's somewhat miraculous, I, I still think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, so is what you're saying that an answer to my question would have to explain this formula on the others, on this field theory side? No. no w without no, doing hard work? Well, it, it, it depends, I suppose, from a field theory point of view. If someone told you, I can calculate this, from some field theory technique, and here is a nice, beautiful formula. Because ADS CFT works, you might feel I must be able to calculate that from supergravity. And the, up until now, the other way, well, yes, I'll go and construct a solution, and I'll just solve PDEs, and I'll do everything, and I'll get the answer. But what I'm saying is, no, you don't. There's a much simpler set of tools to get to see why that's to get to obtain that calculation. But what that exactly what that correspondence is, I don't I don't see at the moment.
So there is some discussion on, on, on when you have the Torix Sasaki Einstein, people discuss the extremization, and then in that case, the vanishing has a meaning in terms of the uh, eliminating the Futaki obstruction, so obstruction of the existence of metrics. So I wonder yeah. if your quant quantity can be related to some obstruction yeah. to the metric, so that you're, you're raising the question of ex existence, but uh, I wonder if this automatically guarantees <laughs> the vanishing result. That was the kind of, yeah, so as you know, for those Torix Sasaki Einstein, there was a possibility of obstruction, then people proved, in fact, they weren't obstructed. Yes, yes. Um, so that, that comment I made right at the end about the, well, it's, it's a bit vague, but um, this, this last point, um, the, this acentral charge and these, the conformal scaling dimension of these Cairo primaries would be something like vanishing of Futaki event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. That's, that's yeah, exactly it'd be nice to yes, make it uh, refresh. And, 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 yeah, and it's, I see, a, see. it's a very physical thing, mm -hmm, which would be very mm -hmm, natural. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Could you say a bit more what goes wrong in odd dimensions with this VVAB theorem? Is it something very deep or is it yes? Um, there's, some, there's some version of the BVAB theorem in odd dimensions, but you have to effectively take another vector and effectively like to occlude climb reduction with respect to that vector and then show that your final answer didn't depend on the choice of vector. It's a very clunky proof. Um, yeah, so th there's something known, but it's, it's a bit, I don't know if this is the best one can do, but it's certainly, it's something along those lines one would have to do. So I think it's definitely something to be, to be explored. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? In that case, let's thank uh, Jerome again.